36. The Land of Culture Too far did I fly into the future. A horror seized upon me. And when I looked around me, lo, there time was my sole contemporary. Then did I fly backwards, homewards, and always faster. Thus did I come unto you, ye present-day men, and into the land of culture. So Arthur was imagining the future when he was talking about the Superman. But he realized that none of his contemporaries are on board with him on these ideas, that they don't understand him. We've seen him shift his focus towards the present, talking about the virtue of self-surpassing. This reconnects him to his own time, and to what he calls the land of culture. That is, modern European society, which regards itself as very civilized and cultured indeed. For the first time brought I an eye to see you, and good desire. Verily with longing in my heart did I come. But how did it turn out with me? Although so alarmed, I had yet to laugh. Never did mine eyes see anything so motley colored. He came with good intentions to try to become part of contemporary discourse and see what he can add to the land of culture. But what he saw there made him want to laugh. Just like the sublime ones, which he mocked in the previous chapter, the land of culture brings out his sarcastic side. Why is it so preposterous in his eyes? Because it is motley colored. I think we can already deduce what he means by that, but he is going to explain it anyway. So let's carry on. I laughed and laughed, while my foot still trembled and my heart as well. Here, forsooth, is the home of all the paint pots, said I. With fifty patches painted on faces and limbs, so sat ye there to mine astonishment, ye present-day men. And with fifty mirrors around you, which flattered your play of colors and repeated it. It's the same picture we got in the first part of the book when Zarathustra was in the city of Pied Cow. Modern culture is motley colored. It has no clear set of values, as the old nations and tribes had. It is rather an amalgam of values, that come from many different cultures. We heard all that already. What is new here is that not only contemporary societies like that, but contemporary people, according to Zarathustra, are also motley colored. They, too, have no clear set of values to direct their lives. They have many contradictory values, which they employ for every occasion. Verily ye could wear no better masks, ye present-day men, than your own faces. Who could recognize you? Written all over with the characters of the past, and these characters also penciled over with new characters, thus have ye concealed yourselves well from all decipherers. And though one be a trier of the reins, who still believeth that ye have reins, out of colours ye seem to be baked, and out of glued scraps. All times and people's gaze diverse coloured out of your veils, all customs and beliefs speak diverse coloured out of your gestures. Contemporary people have no authenticity, nothing that can be defined as their real self. They are a construct of the many cultures of the past. Any attempt to try to discover anything more authentic behind the multicolored mask will only reveal more constructs. Is there even anything real left? He who would strip you of veils and wrappers and paints and gestures would just have enough left to scare the crows. Verily, I myself am the scared crow that once saw you naked and without paint, and I flew away when the skeleton ogled at me. Apparently, there is a little bit left that is authentic, but it is so feeble that there's almost nothing there to build on. Zarathustra confesses that his vapidness is the thing that made him want to escape his contemporaries. Rather would I be a day labourer in the netherworld and among the shades of the bygone, fatter and fuller than ye are forsooth the netherworldlings. This, yea, this, is bitterness to my bowels, that I can neither endure you naked nor clothed, ye present-day men. His laughter and mockery of his contemporaries are only one side of it. He dreads them as well. The condition of today's humanity is unbearable to him. All that is unhomelike in the future, and whatever maketh strayed birds shiver, is verily more homelike and familiar than your reality. 
For thus speak ye, Real are we, holy, and without faith and superstition, thus do ye plume yourselves, alas, even without plumes. Indeed, how would you be able to believe, ye diverse coloured ones, ye who are pictures of all that hath ever been believed? Modern man believes that he liberated himself from the superstitions of the past, that his views are based solely on rationality and science. But actually, his beliefs are just constructs of past ideas. He is just as superstitious as the pre-modern world that he rebelled against. Perambulating refutations are ye of belief itself, and a dislocation of all thought, untrustworthy ones. Thus do I call you, ye real ones. All periods prate against one another in your spirits, and the dreams and pratings of all periods were even realer than your awakeness. More metaphors that say the same thing. You believe that you have positivistic thinking, thinking that is based only on rational thought and empirical evidence, and you think that this makes you real. But your realness is fakery. Unfruitful are ye, therefore do ye lack belief. But he who had to create had always his presaging dreams and astral premonitions, and believed in believing. Half-open doors are ye, at which grave-diggers wait, and this is your reality. Everything deserveth to perish. The real reason why they believe that they are without superstition, says Arthusa, is that they lost their creative force. A creator is someone who molds the world according to a certain vision. He believes in that vision, even if he knows that it is just his own construct. They lost that creativity, so they can no longer believe in anything, and they tell themselves that this lack of belief shows them to be skeptical and without superstition. But it is nothing but nihilism, and this nihilism inevitably leads them to the belief that nothing has value, and everything deserves to perish. Alas, how ye stand there before me, ye unfruitful ones! How lean your ribs! And many of you surely have had knowledge thereof. Many a one hath said, There hath surely a god filched something from me secretly whilst I slept, verily enough to make a girl for himself therefrom. Amazing is the poverty of my ribs, thus hath spoken many a present-day man. This picks up on his earlier remark that these modern people, once stripped of their multicolored robes, are nothing but skeletons with no real substance to fill them. Some of these people, Zarthusa continues his metaphor, realize that they are skeletons, and that there is something missing. But they don't realize that it is flesh that they are missing, so they think that they are missing one of their ribs, and, echoing the story of Genesis, wonder who stole it from them. The actual reason, we know, is that they lost their creative power. And this, we know from previous discourses, happens when you repress your inner forces. Instead of building on their inner impulses to shape themselves, these contemporaries are just following ideas that they believe come from rational and empirical thought, but are actually just fragments of past ideas. This makes them impoverished in spirit, and, as we see in this passage, incapable of even figuring out what it is they are missing. Yea, ye are laughable unto me, ye present-day men, and especially when ye marvel at yourselves. And woe unto me if I could not laugh at your marvelling, and had to swallow all that is repugnant in your platters. As it is, however, I will make lighter of you, since I have to carry what is heavy, and what matter if beetles and maybugs also alight on my load— Verily it shall not, on that account, become heavier to me, and not from you, ye present-day men, shall my great weariness arise. So Arthur decides not to waste any more time on these people. He has his own existence to worry about, his own spiritual quest. There are big questions he still needs to solve, and the burden he undertakes is heavy. His contemporaries, in comparison to these problems, are lightweight and insignificant. Now, whither shall I now ascend with my longing? From all mountains do I look out for fatherlands and motherlands. But a home have I found nowhere. Unsettled am I in all cities.
and decamping at all gates. Alien to me and a mockery are the present-day men, to whom of late my heart impelled me, and exiled am I from fatherlands and motherlands. The problem is, this resolve leaves him adrift. He decided to focus more on the present than on the future, and this made him want to be part of present-day human society. But since he is repelled by it, he cannot find a place in it, and has no place he can call home. Thus do I love only my children's land, the undiscovered in the remotest sea. For it do I bid my sails search and search. Unto my children will I make amends for being the child of my fathers, and unto all the future for this present day. Thus spake Zarathustra. The upshot, then, is that he has to, once again, find his solace in the future but not in the distant future, as he did when he was philosophizing about the Superman. Now he is more focused on creating spiritual children, those who will think in similar ways to him. We know he has students and companions, but we heard that he started to resent them, because they take from him, but he gets nothing from them. Apparently, none of them reached his spiritual heights, none became a friend he can have true intellectual rivalry with. He still awaits successors who will truly implement his teachings in order to develop their spirit and achieve these heights, and the thought of these children, and the land that they will create together, is the only place where he can currently find his home.